Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third annual Battle of the Books. My name is Paige Berger, and I'm the marketing director here at Barrett Bookstore, along with my behind the scenes partner in crime, Rosanna Nissen. And we, along with the entire Barrett Bookstore staff and Margot and Jim Mustick, are thrilled to welcome you to this online gathering tonight. A few housekeeping notes. For those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, it's a webinar platform. That means we cannot see you. We will be bringing the presenters on and off the screen as it is their turn to make their case. So all you need to do is grab a drink, sit back and relax. If you have any comments, feel free to use the chat function on the side of your screen. Should any of the books that are discussed this evening strike your fancy, you can click the, bo uh, the button at the bottom of your screen and you'll be taken directly to our website where you can purchase the books for in-store pickup or home delivery. For those of you who haven't been to a battle before, each of our five panelists will have an opportunity to present their book choice. At the conclusion of the presentation, we are going to take a vote, a virtual vote from the audience. We're gonna talk about the details of that at the end, so don't worry about it now. But the important thing to note is that if you are sitting around a computer with more than yourself, so if you're sitting with your family, you guys are gonna to have to come to an agreement about what book to vote for. So there may be a little discussion of that as we get closer to the end. Finally, I wanna let you know that we have a wonderful door, or I guess screen prize this evening, courtesy of Jim and Margo, which includes a thousand books t-shirt, the wonderful page a day calendar. This is such fun to have on your desk. We have a tote and a mug and a couple other little goodies. So stick around to the end. One lucky winner will be announced uh, before we sign off. So that's it in terms of housekeeping. Before I go ahead and introduce Jim, uh, our esteemed MC for the evening, I do want to offer up an enormous thank you to David Genovese and his team over at Baywater Properties and the Corbin District for helping us host this event. In addition to supporting ways to bring our community together during these unusual times, they are also spearheading the Corbin Cares Project that brings healthy, ready-to-eat meals to those in need. And right now, they're entering another phase of the campaign in partnership with the Darien Foundation. They're going to be bringing dinner from a local restaurant to each and every first responder and essential worker in Darien, including Darien EMS Post 53, the Darien Police, volunteer firefighters, town employees, and all Darien public school teachers and staff. We want to thank Corbin Cares and the Darien Foundation for their incredible work on this project. And if you would like to donate, we've put the link in where you can do that in our chat right now, and we encourage you to do so. All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce Jim Mustick, our honored MC tonight, Jim is the honor is the author of 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die. He began his career in book selling at an independent bookstore in Briarcliff Manor, New York, in the early 1980s. And in 1986, he co-founded the acclaimed book catalog, A Common Reader, and for two decades was its guiding force. He has subsequently worked in editorial and product development as an executive in the publishing industry, Welcome, Jim. I'm going to bring him on now, and we are just so thrilled to have you here with us this evening. Thank you, Paige. It's great to be doing this again with Barrett, and um, I'm looking forward to a wonderful event. And I have to say to our audience and to our presenters, this is the best list of books we've had for a battle yet. So I'm very excited to hear the cases that are made for each of these wonderful books. Good evening to all of you. Thank you for um, tuning in. Uh, we have more than 230 people registered for this event. And I can see from the chat, we have people from as far away as Wichita, San Antonio, Canada, uh, and even Brooklyn. Um, it's been quite a year for all of us. And it's hard to enter this holiday season in the usual festive mood. We're in the grip of a worsening public health crisis and in the throes of a kind of national fever dream that is nearly as anxiety producing as the pandemic. As I think about the somewhat lonelier holiday, many of us will be weathering this December, separated from friends and even family. I recall a song that Judy Garland sang to greet an on-screen 
Christmas 76 years ago. Have yourself a merry little Christmas, it began. Let your heart be light. Next year, all our troubles will be out of sight. Let's hope that proves true for us. On a happier note, it's wonderful to be invited back by Barrett for our third Battle of the Books here. We had a great time about a year ago in December, helping the store celebrate its 80th anniversary with an in-person event. We also hosted our very first virtual Battle of the Books with Mar Barrett back in May. So thank you to Sheila Daly and the rest of the Barrett team, especially Paige and Rosanna Nissen, and to the Corbin District for its support of all three of our appearances here. Next time, I hope we can do this and then walk around the neighborhood and enjoy the ambiance and the many amenities of the development uh, which have been brought together here in Darien. Let me quickly tell you about how these Battle of the Books came about. I spent a long time writing a 1,000-page book called 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die. It was finally published in the fall of 2018, about two years ago. And Margo, my wife, and I traveled around the country talking about it in libraries and bookstores. The best part of those events were the conversations afterwards, after I would talk about how I had spent 14 years writing the book. Um, and in those conversations, I was uh, assured that I'm going to spend the next 14 years finding out from readers what I got wrong, what I left out of the book, the wrong choices I made for certain authors, and so on. But those conversations were fun and always the best part of these events, as I said. And one night, Margot had the inspired idea to make those conversations the centerpiece of an evening of their own. Thus, the Battle of the Books was born, landing us in communities where local luminaries could share their own favorite books with us and their neighbors. In the introduction to the book, I write the following. Once people know you are writing a book called 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, you can never enjoy a dinner party in quite the way you did before. No matter how many books you've managed to consider, and no matter how many pages you've written, every conversation with a fellow reader is almost sure to provide new titles to seek out, or more worryingly, to expose an egregious omission or a gap in your knowledge, to say nothing of revealing the privileges and prejudices however unwitting, underlying your points of reference. For years, as I worked on this book, a thousand books felt like far too many to get my head around. But now it seems too few by several multiples. So let me say what should be obvious. 1,000 books to read before you die is neither comprehensive nor authoritative, nor is it meant to be. It is meant to be an invitation to a conversation, even a merry argument about the books and authors that are missing, as well as the books and authors included. Because the question of what to read next is the best prelude to more important ones, like who to be and how to live. So let's get to it. We have five contestants doing battles this evening. Holly Russell, Kira Parrott, Greg Coles, Thierre Hessart, and Henry Hellander. I will introduce them one by one in alphabetical order and they will each speak for four minutes about a book I left off my list of 1,000 books that they think everybody should read. I will signal them gently when they have 30 seconds left and vehemently when they hit the four minute mark. After all five have pitched their books, you'll be, cast, you'll be able to cast your vote for who was most convincing. Up first is writer and teacher Holly Russell. After writing about rooms and gardens for lifestyle magazines in New York, Holly Russell moved to Darien to raise a family and start her novel, Find the Way Home. Recent poems and personal essays of hers have been published in Hibiscus, Poems That Heal and Empower, The Good Men Project, Pandemic, Poets Respond Live, The Irish Echo, Darien Pollinator Pathway, Stanford Advocate, Motherwell Magazine, and NJ.com. She teaches English language and learning at Building One Community, an immigrant opportunity center in Stanford, Connecticut, and has almost completed her book. Her book tonight is Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. Holly, 
Thank you for being with us. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say about Isabel Wilkerson's wonderful book. Thank you, Jim. Isabel Wilkerson is a Pulitzer Prize winner. And in her book, Cast, she tells a story we think we know, but we don't. It's a brand new story, a revolutionary story about black people in America, white people in America, and power. Who has power? Who does not? Wilkerson calls it a caste system after the ancient social order in India dividing Hindu people into groups and after the Nazis in Germany. Different systems than America's in terms of whom they oppressed and yet brutally similar. America is not a melting pot. Wilkerson writes, it was in the making of the new world that Europeans became white, Africans black, and everyone else yellow, red, or brown. It was in the making of the new world that humans were set apart on the basis of what they looked like and ranked to form a caste system based on a new concept called race. We were all cast into assigned roles to meet the needs of the larger production. None of us are ourselves. I read Cast because I had read Wilkerson's first book, The Warmth of Other Suns. It's about the Great Migration, where, from 1915 to 1970, Black Americans moved out of the South in search of better opportunities. Wilkerson's gift for language, her intellect, passion, and heart, inspired me to write a poem in her honor. Isabel Wilkerson. You slipped through paragraphs and into our minds, bringing clarity where we might prefer blindness. The ragged claw with arrows in its clutch rips deep. You show the blood, the same pulsing river that runs in us all. You tell how science has mapped the human genome. We're 99.9% .9 the same, and yet we judge and push away. You step outside that circle. Inside, the air is hard to breathe. And in a voice as lush as olives, green gold clusters on the bow, you mourn lives lost over centuries. Losses in your own life, mother, father, soul mate lover, black and white, type on paper, one without the other meaningless, but together they form words explaining how and why, urging us to feel pain, love, we might think does not belong to us. Thanks. Holly, thank you very much. That was marvelous. And uh, I hope the rest of your colleagues on the virtual stage tonight have uh, brought their best game because that was fantastic. Thank, thank you, so you much. very much, Jim. It's Whoops. Um, next up, Kira Parrott. Kira is the director of Darien Library a beloved local institution and among one of the best and busiest public libraries in the state. Prior to taking on her new role this September, she worked as the reviews director for Library Journal and School Library Journal, where she oversaw the publications of thousands of book reviews each year. She is delighted to be back at the library where she previously served as the head of children's services. She recently moved from Brooklyn to Norwalk with her husband, Billy, also a librarian, and their two cats. The book she's going to talk about tonight is The Arrival by Sean Tan. Kira, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So as a librarian, a former editor, and a book lover, I have a pet peeve when it comes to books that are described as for all ages. It's what marketing folks and publicists would like us to believe, but it's very rarely true that a book is really for all ages. That is, except for rare gems, works of art that truly transcend age difference, and even sometimes the ability to read. Yeah. 
Such is the case with Sean Tan's The Arrival. When it was first published in 2006, it blew my mind. It quickly became my favorite book of that year and has remained what I consider one of the most brilliant books I have ever experienced. What's unique about The Arrival is that it's completely wordless. It's a graphic novel or maybe a picture book, a work of sequential art, whatever you call it, it's like watching a silent film unfold before your eyes. It's a story about immigration and the immigrant experience with a touch of magical realism. Tan begins the story with a family, a mother, a father, and a child. Through intricately detailed panels and glorious full and double page spreads, we see the father leave his family to go on a journey to a distant land in hopes of a better life. There is sadness and fear, but also hope. During the man's journey on boat um, by boat across a seemingly endless sea, there's this double page spread where Tan uses 54 little boxes in a grid, each depicting the sky in order to show the progression of time. It's a brilliant, beautiful choice, one of many throughout this work. When the man among the huddled masses arrives at his destination, he finds a bustling city, but a confusing one. He doesn't speak the language, nor do we, but through ingenuity and the help of some kind strangers, he figures it out. He finds something to eat, a place to sleep, and a job in a factory. He makes friends too, other immigrants who share their stories, their journeys. Many of them have fled war, persecution, terror. They have fled these horrors, but together in this new community, they find acceptance and support, laughter and joy. The end papers feature 60 miniature portraits of immigrants, and the entire book has this feel of a beloved family scrapbook or an album passed down. It's a timeless tale, and one that I find myself returning to again and again over the years. And every time I do, I discover something new, something that I miss, some little stirring detail in Tan's stunning artwork. It's an immigrant story, but it's so much more than that. The arrival is about memory and longing, about oppression and freedom, about family and community. It's for anyone of any age who, have, who has ever felt like an outsider, who has ever been lost and then found through the power of kindness of a stranger. It's a masterpiece in form and content. And it truly is a book for all ages. It can be shared with children, but also enjoyed by adults for its luminous artwork and resonant themes. It is a true book of my heart and one that will always have a place on my shelf as I hope it will yours. It also makes a wonderful gift. The Arrival by Sean Tan. Kira, thank you so much for that beautiful account of uh... Uh, what is a, a really magical book. It's unforgettable. So you, you captured it perfectly. Thank you so much. Next up, we have uh, Greg Coles, who did a wonderful job presenting the journals of John Cheever in our last event at Barrett. Greg is the senior editor of the Books Desk at the New York Times and poetry editor for the Book Review, where he has worked since 2004. His book tonight, is The Known World by Edward P. Jones. Greg, all yours. Thank you, Jim. Welcome, everyone. The Known World by Edward P. Jones is a historical novel about slavery set in Virginia in the decades before the Civil War. And it centers on a plantation owner named Henry Townsend, who is black and a former slave himself. And even though we'll eventually get the entire story of Henry's life, from slavery to freedom to slave owner, the book more or less opens with his death after a short illness in his 30s, which sets up all of the chaos that will follow. I knew about this book for a long time before I read it. Maybe you do too. It won the Pulitzer Prize in 2004. And in 2005, the Times Book Review picked it as one of the best novels of the past 25 years in a survey that I organized. So I was intrigued by it. 
but it also had that dutiful whiff of a classic that for me anyway sometimes makes me resist a book and in this case kept me from actually picking it up until earlier this year when the Times critic A.O. Scott wrote an essay about Edward P. Jones for the cover of the book review. And I'm happy to say that there's nothing dutiful about it at all. This book is just a marvel. It's a completely vivid, immersive, and patient description of the world in all its moral complexity and consequences. The language isn't showy or particularly lyrical. It often reads like history, but it's a very rich novel so filled with incident that it's impossible to summarize the plot in just four minutes. It would probably be impossible to summarize in four days. One reason for that is that Jones has imagined it so fully that every character he introduces comes with a complete and complicated life history. I'll give just one small example. In the opening pages, as Henry is dying, we learn that Caldonia, his wife, has seen only one other death in her life, that of her father. And then Jones adds, almost as an aside, that the father had been secretly poisoned by his own wife. Then he moves on. But we learn later that the poisoning was because Caldonia's mother suspected that he was going to free their slaves and destroy the family's wealth. And that act, that murder, will have implications for Caldonia and the Townsend plantation. So this is a book with dozens, if not hundreds, of minor characters, and they all have their own backstories. You get the feeling that Jones could give you a whole genealogy for any one of them, complete with all the family scandals and gossip. But at heart, it's of course a novel about slavery, both as an economic system and as a means of control. It's partly about how participating in a corrupt system forces you to set aside your best intentions and compromise your values how in fact the system actively rewards you for bending to its will. Henry starts out wanting to be a good and kind master, but there's a telling moment where we learn that his favorite line from Paradise Lost is Satan saying that he would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. And it's partly about the desire for control, how pushed to extremes that desire is not only futile, but dangerous. But also it's a novel about people doing the best they can under hellish conditions, sometimes of their own making and sometimes not. And if that's not a recommendation for reading it right now, never mind before you die, then I don't know what is. Thank you for listening. And thanks to Jim for moderating and Barrett's books and all of the sponsors. And thank you. Greg, thank you for speaking so eloquently about uh, an extraordinary book that I just will add in my experience, the ending of it, it was, when I read it, it literally took my breath away. It, it's an amazing ending. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Um, next up, I want to remind everybody that there's a button at the bottom of your screen if you want to buy the books from Barrett uh, to make it easy for you. Um, and our fourth contestant tonight is Tier Hessert, founder of Mama Collective, an in-person discussion group for moms in multiple stages of motherhood to provide support, friendship, and food for thought. She's on the Parks and Recreation Committee in Darien and the board of the Roten Presbyterian Nursery School. Loves the outdoors and anything to do with placemaking. Tier is most proud of her family. She has four children, ages six, five, five, and three, and almost one with her husband, Bill. That's a collective in itself. He is originally from Southern California, but has been on the East Coast for 12 years and loves Darianne. And her book tonight is Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Pierre, all yours. Thank you. I want to start just by saying that in college, I won a battle of the books, so I'm really here to regain my title. <laughs> that said, the book, yes, that I'm battling tonight was uh, a rap, was written almost 150 years ago, but it could not be more timely today during a pandemic. In the book, there are two main characters, Phileas Fogg and his servant, take it with a grain of salt, pass a part two. Phileas <laughs> places a bet with his friends that he can go around the world in 80 days and they successfully make it in the nick of time. This was the only book I wanted to bring to the table tonight, and I'm going to tell you in three reasons. The first reason is the theme of time. Let's face it. We don't know how much time we have here. We don't know how long we will live, and it's up to us to make the most of our time here. 
In the book, when Phileas places a bet with his friends, they're all playing a leisurely game at the club. It's in the early evening. He places a bet. He looks up at the clock and says, the train leaves at 9 p.m. I will take it. One of the biggest lessons in this book is this. We can't wait around for life to happen to us. We have to make it happen. Phileas lives and breathes this. He packs his bag with two shirts and three pants, and he knows that things will come together when needed. He knows that if he waited for things to be perfectly in place, that he would be waiting forever. My second reason is travel. Now that we have limited travel opportunities during this pandemic, this book transports you all over the world and brings you back to your own travel memories. Upon their arrival to Bombay, Passepartout is overcome with excitement. I quote, his old vagabond nature returned to him. The fantastic ideas of his youth once more took possession of him. So since we can't travel in the same way right now, this book will provide you all the wanderlust that you need. The third reason is our reactions. So throughout the whole journey around the world, Phileas remains calm, cool, and collected. Even throughout many setbacks, nothing ruffles his feathers. In one part, their train in India stopped abruptly, and the tracks were not laid out to the next train. And they had to complete their journey. They had to find their own transportation and think creatively. Did Phileas get stressed out? No. He simply said, I have constantly foreseen the likelihood of certain obstacles. How amazing is that? When my husband and I both read this book together, we were coming back from a trip. We were running very late to a flight, really cutting it close. And he turns to me while he's running and says, channel Phileas. <laughs> and that's what we have continued to remind ourselves for years now, channel Phileas. In life, you can constantly foresee, if you can constantly foresee, the likelihood of obstacles and channel the calm energy of Phileas. Things just feel easier. So I leave you with three reasons why to choose this book. Don't wait for life to happen to you. Go up and do it now. Make your dreams happen. Number two, travel. And this can even be through a book. And third, channel Phileas. But for the grand conclusion, I haven't even told you the best part of the book but that's for you to read. Phileas learns something that we all need a reminder of. It doesn't have to do with time and it doesn't have to do with travel. It's about the people in our life who make the journey worthwhile. So go forth, channel Phileas, and I hope you enjoy Around the World in 80 Days. Thank you. Fantastic. That was marvelous. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, really to find a book like that that everyone thinks they know and to refresh it for all of us is great. Channel Phileas is, is going to be a motto. Thank you, dear. You're welcome. Thank you. Our final contestant is Henry Hellander, co-founder of To and From, a mindful nail concept. Always an avid collector of books as a child. He had to buy all the books he saw but rarely read. Now he uses books to expand his mind and actually reads them. When he's not busy in the salon or creating a new skincare line vessel with his best friend, Jean, you can find him running to New York City and reading on the way. And his book tonight is On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong. Henry? Thanks, oh, yeah. Thanks, Bear Bookstore. Here we go. Dear Ma, quote, Migration can be tri triggered by the angle of sunlight, indicating a change in season, temperature, plant life, and food supply. Female mon monarchs lay eggs along the route. Every history has more than one thread, each thread a story of division. The journey takes 4,830 miles, more than the length of this country. The monarchs that fly south will not make it back north. Each departure then is final. Only their children return. Only the future revisits the past. Did you know, Ma? Your past is your future and we can't break free of. Something that's passed down from generation to generation and lives deep within our body's tissues. This is something I learned through the sacred art of therapy. Wars that you and Pops fought, wars that our great-great-grandparents battled, 
are something we have buried so deep in our bones and have not even awakened to it. Because I am you and Pops, you are Grams and Gramps, and they are their parents' history. Vong writes, Ma, the nameless yellow body was not considered human because it did not fit in a box on a piece of paper. Sometimes you are erased before you are given the choice of stating who you are, to be or not to be. That is the question. This reference to race identity feels like an identity I too struggled to find as a child. My quality is all feminine. I preferred Barbies, braiding hair, and doing cartwheelers. Soccer and baseball never filled my build, and you and Pa always let me explore. But school, school had decided who I was to be. I was not one of the boys. I fit better with the girls, but I was not sure who to be. This internal dialogue and this struggle to find someone to help me understand who I was. It all happened in the theater, the magic illusion, but it took some sort of magic to find me, a young gay man. Like Vaughn says, I remember it. I remember it all because how can you forget anything about the day you first found yourself beautiful? I moved to New York and discovered the beauty of being able to live the truly authentic life's life, to discover who I was and where my place was. But, to, 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 but determined to have a better life than my tissues deep inside my bones were creating, I did what you and Pops taught me, head down and keep going, because you were determined that my future would not be a memory of our past, that my journey would be the future you dreamed of, but were rerouted and replanned. In the book I recently read, On Earth We Are Briefly Gorgeous, the author explains how the buffalo run off the side of a cliff and the whole herd fo follows. It's as if mother nature tells them to jump and they go on and they do it, like they have no choice. But just like the author, but just like the author of the book, we did what our past couldn't do. And quote, like Vong says, just as the first one of us steps off the cliff onto the air, the forever nothing below, they ignite us, ignite into ochre red sparks of monarchs. Thousands of monarchs pour over the edge, fan into the white air like blood jet hitting water. I race through the city as if the cliff were never in my story. Ma, you and Pops carried me through the cliff. Your struggle was not mine and your story was just the past of my future. Because we are survivors. And like Vong says, because, of the, sun, because the sunset, like survival, exists only on the verge of its own disappearing. To be gorgeous, you must first be seen. I know you and Pops always saw me. Love your son, Henry. On Earth We Are Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Bong is a must read before you die. I choose this as a part of a collection of LGBTQ plus literature one must read. This will be the first book I share with anyone wanting to better understand what coming of age as a gay youth truly feels like. A letter written to his mother where he cracks himself open and bears his soul. As NPR says, this book is devastatingly beautiful novel, a painful but extraordinary coming of age story about surviving the aftermath of trauma. Bong's upbringing was laden from abuse from his mother and protected by a loving grandmother. I don't know trauma or the physical abuse of a parent, but I do understand our traumas of parents suffered make up who we become. The past is the past in many different ways. We learned Bong suffered abuse until he was old enough to say enough and break the cycle. This book is... <laughs> Go ahead, I'll give you... All right. This book is written like beautiful poetry. A childhood feels so dark and moments also feel like a painting of peaches. On Earth is a story that brings the eye of the reader to what it means to survive and keep living because we are at the edge of a cliff and we have the choice to fall with the herd or to fly if we are lucky enough like butterflies. On Earth, We Are Briefly Gorgeous is the 1001 book you must read before you die. Henry, thank you very much. That was beautiful. Thanks. Those are our five books. And as I said, this is the best lineup of books we've had. And if you promise not to tell any of our former contestants, it's really the most consistent and best uh, set of uh, presentations. So I thank all of our presenters. And I ask you all to give them a huge virtual round of applause. We're going to vote now, give you the opportunity to vote. And before you do, I want to remind you that all these books are available at Barrett Bookstore. It is a marvelous collection. If you're doing your holiday shopping, you should buy all of them because there's something for everyone on your list. And if you don't know people who would be interested in these books, you should go out and meet them because they will enrich your life. You'll see at the bottom of your screen now a little red dot and the word polls. If you click on that, 
you will be presented with a menu and you can cast your vote. While you're doing that, I am going to tell you about a book I'm reading now, a new book. It's in the Barrett Holiday Catalog called Eleanor by David Michaelis. It's a biography of Eleanor Roosevelt that's absolutely marvelous. And I recommend it to you both for its story of um, an American woman and public service servant of extraordinary dimensions that is wonderfully researched and written. Um, and it is a story of New York, old New York. It's a story of America in the 20th century. And as I say, of an extraordinary woman. I want to read something from the acknowledgments because this is a passage that's the that I've read recently that has stuck with me the most. And in it, the author, uh, David Michaelis, talks about having met Mrs. Roosevelt when he was four years old. And he asked her for something. Mrs. R glided to a full stop, he writes. Time itself stopped as the white-haired lady leaned down and looked into my eyes. I believe I breathed out two words, juicy fruit. She responded merrily, her eyes blue as gas jets, the big toothy smile luminous. I have no recollection of anything she said. I was held close by an intensely noticing gaze, which was so full of goodwill, it seemed to brim out of her eyes as light. I had never seen that actual goodness flowing out of a human being. And only long afterward realized how fortunate I was to have felt it full in the face at four. Eleanor, biography of Eleanor Roosevelt, I recommend to you. It looks like our voting has uh, finished up and it is a very tight race, but uh, I'm gonna give 10 more seconds for anyone to cast votes and then we will have our winner. And no one can appeal. I just want you to know. I don't care what court you go to. These results will be final. Okay. Our winner is Around the World in 80 Days by Thierry Hessart. Thank you so much. Second place cast. And then the arrival and on Earth were briefly gorgeous, but a great um, thing, I know if, if you were like me, there were a number of books you could have voted for among the five. Um, thanks again, a virtual round of applause. Uh, before we get to awarding our fabulous uh, screen prize, there's a few more things I'd like to talk about. So Paige, if you don't mind letting me say a few things. One is we've built a website uh, for 1,000 books to read before you die. It's at 1,000books2read.com. That's the number is 1,000books2read.com. You can go on and see my whole list. You can, most importantly, you can all add your own books, just like our contestants did tonight, to what we're calling the next 1,000, so everyone can see them. So I hope you'll go to the website and check it out. And while you're there, you can sign up for my newsletter, which goes out uh, every other Friday. There'll be a new issue tomorrow in which I happen to write about one of the books that was discussed tonight. So if you want to subscribe to the newsletter, go to the website. There's a link in the chat right now. And uh, if you sign up tonight, you'll get the newsletter tomorrow. Uh, again, I encourage you to shop at Barrett. Please order one or all of the books you heard discussed tonight. Uh, and mine will have a signed book plate uh, if you choose to uh, give it. And I have to say, it's a pretty good gift. It's so important to support local businesses today, and especially local bookstores. Sheila and her team are pillars of the community and exemplars of the bookselling vocation, which in the words of Roger Mifflin, the bookselling protagonist of Christopher Morley's novel, The Haunted Bookshop, is to spread good books about to sow them on fertile minds, to cultivate understanding and a carefulness of life and beauty. In that spirit, let me share with you the conclusion of the introduction to my book. To get lost in a book, be it a story or a study, 
is inherently to acknowledge the voice of another, to broaden one's perspective beyond the confines of one's own understanding. A good book is the opposite of a selfie. The right book at the right time can expand our lives in the way love does, making us more thoughtful, more generous, more brave, more alert to the world's wonders and more pained by its inequities, more wise, more kind. All those qualities are more important now than they've ever been, for they are the most enduring vaccination we can have against the diseases, both literal and figurative, that darken our days right now. In times like these, it's good to have company of books and of readers, and I'm grateful to all of our contestants and for all of you who've been watching. Thanks especially to Barrett Bookstore for the use of the hall and to the Corbin District for inspiring and supporting tonight's festivities. Let me close before I turn it over to Paige with a quotation from the philosopher William James. It's from a letter he wrote to a friend in 1868. Remember when old December's darkness is everywhere about you, that the world is really in every minutest part point as full of life as in the most joyous morning you ever lived through, that the sun is wanging down and the waves dancing and the gulls skimming down at the mouth of the Amazon, for instance, as freshly as in the first morning of creation. And the hour is just as fit as any hour that ever was for a new gospel of cheer to be preached. Happy holidays, happy reading, be well, and I'll turn it back to Paige to tell us who in the audience has won our window prize. Thank you all, good night. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much for bringing us this event once again. Thank you, panelists. Oh my gosh, what a wonderful, wonderful evening. Yes, we have a winner. So if you stuck around, Tammy Slode, we have your gift package here and we will have it on the hold shelf behind the counter. To the rest of you, to our customers, to those who are new to us, thank you so much for your support of independent bookstores. We know sometimes it takes a little bit of an extra step to come in here, and we are so grateful for the support you've given us for the last 81 years and hopefully for many more years to come. We're open and we welcome you in the store, and our website is also open 24 hours a day, so you can place your orders there via the link below. We hope you have a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Be well. Good night. <laughs>